Hi, these are the trigonometry lectures for educator.com and today we're going to talk about the half angle formulas. So the main formulas that we're going to be using today, we have a formula for sine of one half x and cosine of one half x. They're a little bit cumbersome. Uh, sine of one half x is equal to plus or minus the square root of one minus of one half of one minus cosine x. Cosine of one half x same formula except there's a plus in it. So they're a little bit cumbersome but we'll practice using them and you'll see that they're not so bad. What makes them difficult is the plus or minus and the square root signs. That's probably the confusing part. Um, actually what's inside the square root sign isn't bad at all. The 1 minus cosine x, 1 plus cosine x aren't too bad. So let's try them out right away with some examples. So our first example is to find the sine and cosine of 15 degrees and then we'll check that our answer satisfy the Pythagorean identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So the first thing to notice here is 15 degrees is not a common value. So it's not one that where we've memorized the, uh, the sine and cosine. So we'll have to use the half angle formulas here. We'll start with 15 is 1 half of 30 and so we're going to use that the sine formula, remember sine of one half x is equal of one half x is equal to plus or minus the square root of one half one minus cosine x. So the x in question here is 30. We're trying to find the sine of 15. So sine of 15 is equal to plus or minus the square root of one half of one minus cosine of 30. So that's plus or minus the square root of one half. Now, 30 degrees is a common value. That's pi over six, and I've got all the sines and cosines of the common values memorized. Cosine of pi over six, cosine of 30, is root three over two. So now I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra with this expression here. Plus or minus the square root of one half so I'm going to put 1 and root 3 over 2 over a common denominator. That'll be 2 minus root 3 over 2. I'm just writing 1 there is 2 over 2. And if I combine these, um, I get 2 minus root 3 over 4. And I still have this plus or minus, which is not very good because I want to give a single answer. I don't want to give two different answers. But let's remember where 15 degrees is. Here's 0 degrees and here's 90 degrees. 15 degrees is way over here right in the first quadrant. And since sine and cosine are the x and y values, actually sine is the y value and cosine is the x value, um, they're both positive in the first quadrant. So 15 degrees is in quadrant 1. So the sine is its y value, it's positive. Sine of 15 is greater than 0, it's positive. So our answer then is sine of 15 must be the positive square root there. It's the square root of 2 minus root 3 over 4. Now, if you've been paying really close attention to the educator.com trigonometry lectures, you'll know that we've actually solved this problem before. 15 degrees, if you convert it to radians, is actually pi over 12. And we worked out the sine of pi over 12 before, not using the half angle identities, but using the addition and subtraction formulas. We worked out the sine of pi and cosine of pi over 12 by realizing it as pi over 4 minus pi over 6. And when we worked it out, sine of pi over 12 using these subtraction formulas, we got the answer square root of 6 minus the square root of 2 over 4. And so there's a little bit of a, of a, of a worry here because it seems like we did the same problem using two different sets of formulas 
and we got two quite different looking answers. We got the square root of 6 minus square root of 2 over 4 last time we did it, and this time we have the square root of 2 minus the square root of 3 all over 4. Actually, that could be simplified a little bit into, if we just take the square root of the top part, and then the square root of 4 is just 2. So we have these two different answers here, or at least they seem to be different. Well, let me show you that these two answers can actually be reconciled. So how do these answers agree? Well, let me start with the old answer, the one we did in a previous lecture on educator.com. Our old answer was root 6 minus root 2 over 4. And what I'm going to do is square the numerator, root 6 minus root 2 squared. And of course, to pay for that, I have to take its square root later. And remembering an algebra formula, a minus b quantity squared is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So I remember that algebra formula, and I've got a, a, a quantity that I'm squaring here. Root 6 squared is 6 minus 2 root 6 root 2 plus root 2 squared is just 2, all over 4. And so this simplifies down to 8 minus 2 root 12 over 4. But root 12, I could pull a, a 4 out of that, and it turns into a 2 on the outside. But I already had a 2 on the outside, so you combine those, and you get 4 root 3 over 4. And now I can factor a 4 out of the numerator. And that when it comes outside, it becomes a 2. So left on the inside will be the 8 turns into a 2, and the minus 4 root 3 just becomes a minus root 3 over 4. And that simplifies down. The 2 fourths cancels into 1 half. Square root of 2 minus root 3 over 2. And look at that. That's our new answer that we just derived using the half angle formula. So we could do that problem using the addition and subtraction formulas as we did a couple of lectures ago, or we could do it using our new half angle formula, working it out from what we know about 30 degrees. Either way, we get down to the same answer. Of course, we still have to find the cosine of 15 degrees. So we're going to use the half angle formula for cosine, cosine 1 half x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 half times 1 plus cosine x. So the cosine of 15, 15 is 1 half of 30. So this is square root of 1 half times 1 plus cosine 30. Cosine 30 is a common value that I remember very well. 1 plus root 3 over 2. And if I put those, combine those over a common denominator, I get 1 half 2 plus root 3 over 2. And that simplifies down to 2 plus root 3 over 4, or if I take the square root of the bottom, 2 plus root 3 over 2. Still have that plus or minus, but remember, 15 degrees is safely there in the first quadrant. So it's sine and cosine, it's x and y values. They're both positive. So 15 degrees is in quadrant 1. So cosine of 15 is positive. So the cosine of 15 must be the positive square root 2 plus root 3 over 2.
So there's my answer. The last thing we were supposed to check there was that the answers satisfy the Pythagorean identity of sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. So sine squared of 15 plus cosine squared of 15. Well, sine squared of 15 was 2 minus root 3, root, square root of 2 minus root 3 over 2. We're going to square that. Plus cosine squared of 15 is 2 plus root 3, square root of that over 2. So we'll square that one out. And now in the top, the square root and the square will cancel each other away. So we get 2 minus root 3. In the bottom, we have 2 squared is 4 plus 2 plus root 3 over 4. When we add those together, the root 3's cancel, and we just get 4 over 4, which is 1. So when we worked out sine squared of 15 plus cosine squared of 15, we did indeed get 1, showing that it does confirm the Pythagorean identity. So the key to that problem was really just recognizing that 15 is 1 half of 30, and then invoking the sine and cosine half angle formulas plugging in x equals 30, working them through, doing a little bit of algebra, and getting our answers there. The only other step that was a little bit tricky was recognizing whether we wanted to use the positive or the negative square roots. And that's a matter of recognizing that 15 degrees is in the first quadrant. So in both cases, sine and cosine are both positive. So for our second example here, uh, we're asked to use to prove a trigonometric identity, cosine of 1 half x plus sine of 1 half x over cosine of 1 half x minus sine of 1 half x is equal to secant x plus tangent x. Now that's a pretty complicated identity. It's not really obvious where to start. Um, you might want to jump into the half angle formulas because you see cosine x and si cosine 1 half x, sine of 1 half x. I'm going to say let's try to avoid the half angle formulas here if we can. Here's why. Remember that cosine of 1 half x is equal to plus or minus the square root of something or other. And so is sine of 1 half x is equal to plus or minus the square root of something or other. If we start putting those in, we're going to have plus or minuses. We'll have lots of square roots. It's going to get complicated. I'm going to try to avoid those. Instead, I have another strategy, which we've seen before in proving trigonometric identities. If you have a plus b times a minus b, remember from algebra, that's a difference of squares formula. That's a squared minus b squared. That can be really useful if you have an a plus b in, in a denominator or an a minus b in a denominator. You multiply both sides by the conjugate, by the other one, and then you get that difference of squares. So let's try that out on this one. The left-hand side. I'm going to work with the left-hand side because I see that a minus b in the denominator. So that's cosine of 1 half x plus sine of 1 half x over cosine 1 half x minus sine of 1 half x. Now I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. That means where I saw a, plus, where I saw a minus before, I'm going to multiply by the same expression with a plus in it, sine of 1 half x. And of course, I have to multiply the top by the same thing, cosine 1 half x plus sine of 1 half x. And let's see where we go with that. Well, in the numerator, we actually have cosine of 1 half x plus sine of 1 half x squared. So that's cosine squared 1 half x plus 2 sine half x cosine 1 half x plus sine squared 1 half x. In the bottom, we can invoke this difference of squares formula. So we get cosine squared 1 half x minus sine squared 1 half x. Now, there are several good things that are going to happen right now. But they're all, they will only happen if you remember the double angle identities. So let me write those down for you. And I'm going to write them in terms of theta instead of x. So 
remember that sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta. Cosine of 2 theta is equal to cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. And now look at what we have here. Well, there's several good things that are going to happen. First of all, cosine squared and sine squared. Those combine, and those give me a 1. Now we have 2 sine of something cosine of something. And the something is 1 half x. So if you look back at our sine 2 theta, 2 sine of something cosine of something is equal to, two, is equal to sine of 2 times that thing. So we have sine of 2 times 1 half x. Now I have cosine squared of something minus sine squared of something. And I know that cosine squared of something minus sine squared of something is equal to cosine of 2 times that something. So cosine of 2 times 1 half x. You can simplify this a little bit. This is 1 plus sine of x over cosine x. And I'll split that up into 1 over cosine x plus sine x over cosine x. And those are expressions that I recognize. 1 over cosine x is secant x. Sine over cosine x is tangent x. And look, now we've got the right-hand side of the original trigonometric identity. That was the right-hand side right there. So that was a pretty tricky one. There were several key steps involved there. Um, the first is looking at the left-hand side and noticing that we have something minus something in the bottom. So we're going to uh, use this difference of squares formula. We're going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. Once we multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, we get something that looks pretty messy, but we start invoking these identities all over the place. First of all, sine squared plus cosine squared gives you 1. Secondly, 2 sine of something, cosine of something. That's the double angle formula for sine. And then cosine squared of something minus sine squared of something. That's the double angle formula for cosine. That simplifies it down into 1 plus sine x over cosine x. Those split apart and convert easily into secant and tangent. And all of a sudden, we have the right-hand side. So you may have to experiment a bit with different uh, techniques when you're proving these trigonometric identities. The ones that I'm using for examples, these are ones I've worked out ahead of time, so I know right away which technique I'm going to use. But even when I'm working on these, I'll try multiplying a few different things together, maybe splitting things up differently, invoking different uh, half angle formulas, double angle formulas, and finally I find the sequence that works. So when you're asked to prove these trigonometric identities, Go ahead and experiment a little. If it seems like it's getting really complicated, maybe go back and try something else. Eventually, you'll find something that converts one side of the equation into the other. For our next example, we have to prove a half angle formula for tangents. And we're told to be careful about removing plus or minus signs. And the reason for that is we're going to be using the sine and cosine half angle formulas. And those both have plus or minus signs in them. So let me remind you what those are. The cosine of 1 half x is plus or minus the square root of 1 half times 1 plus cosine x. The sine of 1 half x is plus or minus the square root of 1 half times 1 minus cosine x. So those are the formulas we're going to be using. We're given the tangent of 1 half x. So let me start with that. I'll call that the left-hand side. Left-hand side is tangent of 1 half x. Now I don't have a formula yet for tangent of 1 half x, so I'm going to Split that up into sine of 1 half x 
over cosine of one half x because I do have formulas for those. So those are my half angle formulas. So in the numerator I get plus or minus the square root of one half. Sine of one half x is one minus cosine x. And the denominator is cosine of one half x, the same thing except that I get one half one plus cosine of x. Now here's the thing, you might think that you can cancel plus or minus signs, but you really can't. The reason is that plus or minus signs means that the, both the top and bottom could be positive or could be negative. When you divide them together, you don't know if the answer is going to be positive or negative. So I'm going to put one big plus or minus sign on the outside, but I can't just cancel those away. I'm also going to combine everything under the square root here, and I get one half, one minus cosine x over one half, one plus cosine x. And the obvious thing to do there is to cancel the one halves. So you get one minus cosine x over one plus cosine x. Now it's not so obvious where to go from here, but remember that we've been practicing this rule a minus b times a plus b is equal to a squared minus b squared. That comes up all over the place with trigonometric identities and with other algebra algebraic formulas as well. Uh, the trick is when you have either one of those in a denominator, you multiply by the conjugate. So here we have one minus cosine x in the denominator. I'm going to multiply by one plus cosine x. Of course, I have to multiply the numerator by the same thing. Uh, sorry, I have one plus cosine x in the denominator. So the conjugate would be one minus cosine x. Multiply top and bottom by one minus cosine x. And the point of that is to invoke this difference of squares formula in the denominator. This is all taking place under a big square root. One minus cosine x, I'll just write that as one minus cosine x squared. I don't need to multiply that out. In the bottom, I've got one minus cosine x times one plus cosine x. That's a difference of squares formula. That's one minus cosine squared x. Now, I'm going to separate out the top and the bottom part here because in the top I've got a square root of a perfect square. So on the top I'm just going to write it as 1 minus cosine x because I had the square root of 1 minus cosine x squared. In the bottom I still have a square root. 1 minus cosine squared x, that's something that should set off some warning bells in your brain. It certainly does not mind because I remember that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, the Pythagorean identity. And so if you move that around, if you see 1 minus cosine squared, that's equal to sine squared. And so 1 minus cosine squared x is equal to sine squared x. And now that cancels with the square root. I've already got a plus or minus outside, so I don't need to add another one. 1 minus cosine x over sine x. So I've almost got what I want. I've almost got the right-hand side, 1 minus cosine x over sine x. The problem is this plus or minus, and the, and the directions of this exercise said we had to be very careful about why we can remove any plus or minus signs. So let me write the big question here. Why can we remove this? And that actually takes a bit of explanation. I'm going to go on to a new slide to explain that. So from the last slide, we figured out that the left-hand side is equal to plus or minus 1 minus cosine x over sine x. Uh, but we aren't sure if we can remove the plus or minus from the right-hand side. 
So let's think about that. First of all, I know that cosine x is always less than 1. That's because cosine x is, remember, it's, it's the x values on the unit circle, so it's always between negative 1 and 1. So 1 minus cosine x, cosine x, is always greater than 0. So the numerator here, the 1 minus cosine x part, the numerator, 1 minus cosine x, is always positive. So that part isn't really affected by the plus or minus. What about the sine x? I know that that is not always positive. What about sine x? So let me draw a unit circle because this really depends on where x lies on the unit circle. And there are several different cases depending on where x lies on the unit circle. Let me write down the four quadrants, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And let's try and figure out where x could lie on the unit circle. So there's sort of four cases. If x is in quadrant 1. Then remember, sine x is its y value. So sine x is positive. And x over 2, if x is in quadrant 1, if that's x right there, then x over 2 will also be in quadrant 1. So tangent of x will also be positive. Remember, all students take calculus. They're all positive in the first quadrant. Second quadrant, only sine is. Third quadrant, only tangent is. And fourth quadrant, only cosine is. So if x is in quadrant 1, then they're both positive. Both sides here, the tangent of 1 half x and the sine x. Oops, I said tangent of x, and I should have said the tangent of 1 half x, or x over 2. They're both positive. Let's check the second quadrant. If x is in quadrant 2, then sine x will still be positive. And x over 2, well, if x is over here in quadrant 2, then x over 2 will be in quadrant 1, because it's half of x. So its tangent will still be positive. So again, both the sine x and the tangent x will both be positive. Third case is if x is in quadrant 3, then sine x is less than 0 because x is down here in quadrant 3. Now, where will x over 2 be? x over 2, if x is in quadrant 3, that means x is bigger than pi. So x over 2 is bigger than pi over 2. x over 2 will be over here in quadrant 2. So tangent of x over 2, in quadrant 2, only the sine is positive. The tangent is negative. So sine is negative because x is in quadrant 3, and tangent of x over 2 is, is also negative. And finally, if x is in quadrant 4, then sine x is less than 0 because it's still below the x-axis. Its y-coordinate is negative. 
And x over 2, if x is somewhere over here in the fourth quadrant, x is between pi and 2 pi, x over 2 will be between pi over 2 and pi. So x over 2 is still in quadrant 2. So tan x over 2 is still negative. Now there's four cases there. In the first two cases, sine was positive and tangent was positive. Tangent x over 2 is positive. In the second two cases, in the last two cases, sine was negative and tangent x over 2 was, was also negative. So sine x and tangent x over 2, they're either both negative or they're both positive. That means they have the same plus or minus sign, have the same uh, sign in the terms of positive or negative, not S-I-N-E, have the same sign. So we can drop the plus or minus and finally say, tangent of x over 2, or tangent of 1 half x, is equal to 1 minus cosine x over sine x. In all four cases, the tangent of x over 2 has the same plus or minus as sine of x. And then remember, the 1 minus cosine x is always positive. So the left hand, the right hand side, will always have the same uh, plus or minus, so we don't need to attach another plus or minus. So that was a pretty tricky one. The secret to that was starting with a tangent of x over 2, expanding it out using the formulas for cosine of, of 1 half x and sine of 1 half x, or x over 2. We worked it down. We did some algebra simplifying a square root, but then we still had that plus or minus at the end, and what we had to do was this sort of case-by-case -case study of each of the four quadrants to say, when is sine positive or negative? When is tangent of x over 2 positive or negative? Because the last term, the 1 minus cosine x, was always positive. Finally, we figured out that sine x and tangent of x over 2 could be positive or negative, but they'll always be the same. So we don't need to put in a plus or minus there. So we'll try some more examples later on. Uh, the examples we're going to be using later, we're going to be using this formula for tangent of x over 2. So it's worth remembering this formula for tangent of x over 2. And then later on, we'll be using that to solve some more trigonometric identities.